This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. From part 88 of Understanding the Kingdom series. And this one is called Clay, Authority, and Kingdom Transformation. And I already had uh, some of it done, and I was sitting the other day uh, in my chair and just kind of watching something on TV, kind of praying in between. And, and uh, God has a sense of humor, I have found, especially with me. And I'm sitting there, and the Holy Spirit said, Clay, what's it good for? And I'm thinking, well, he kind of said it like, you know, war, what's it good for? Absolutely nothing. And he said, well, Clay's good for a lot of things. And he began to share with me some concepts of clay and not only the, the molding of the clay that we're going to be getting into, but also the authority that comes with earth. There's a reason why God made man out of earth. Had, uh, I love one comedian back in the 80s. She, her book was God Uses Cracked Pots. Because we all are. But I want to start in Job chapter 26. I want to deal with the first war. And this really is not uh, dealt with a lot in a lot of circles. And you have to be on the fringe with Steve Quayle, Tom Horn, me and others to deal with some of these. But if you look at our solar system, there is signs of upheaval. That something hit Mars, tore away its atmosphere. There is an asteroid belt where a planet used to be. Uh, several of the planets are not just set on an axis like Earth, but one of them, I think it's Neptune, is literally on its side north and, north and south go this way. And something happened, something, there was, there was a battle in the heavens. And, I, and you know, I, I've tried to study the, you know, the gap between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, and you line up all the Hebraicists. Now, what a lot of the dispensationalists won't tell you is that the majority of Hebraists believe that the earth, that Genesis 1, 1 is a complete statement, and then it should be, and the earth was made, something happened to make it void, or loose chaos on it. And when we understand that, we understand that there, were, there was a war in heaven that affected our solar system. Uh, um, let, me, let me read this, then we can comment on it, starting in verse 5. And the departed spirits trembled under the waters and their, habitation, and their inhabitants. Naked is Sheol before him, and Abaddon has no covering. Sounds familiar, goes back to Revelation. He stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps up the waters in, the, in his clouds, and the clouds do not burst under them. He obscures the face of the full moon. He spreads out his cloud over it. He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and day. 
And some have tried to use this circle in the flat earth movement to say that the, the earth is, like we're, on a, we're on a pizza pan, but yet when you dig and you listen to the Hebraist, that same word can also be translated globe or ball, okay? He goes on to say, the pillars of heaven tremble and are amazed at his rebuke. So there was a rebuke at one time that happened that amazed heaven. He quieted the sea with his power, and by his understanding, he shattered Rahab. And by his breath, the heavens are cleared, but his hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. Now, that word serpent in Hebrew is Nahesh, the same entity that we see in Genesis 3, the Nahesh. The, it could, that word can be translated dragon. It was a seraph. That God pierced it. There was a war that went on. And what's interesting is you begin looking at all this, and we don't necessarily know what angels were made out of, but they were not made out of any planetary body. Because the Bible says the sons of God sang at God's creation. He created them first, and then he created what we know as the physical universe. But there was authority given. Lucifer's throne, I believe, was originally on Rahab. It was shattered. And what's interesting, Tom Horn's new books on the messenger and, and um, oh, what is the name there? They're calling that asteroid Apophis uh, that will soon be traveling the heavens as it, as it veers out of the orbit of the asteroid belt. It will look like a winding serpent on fire as it heads toward the earth. Now, they say it's going to be a near miss. But it's going to come so close to the earth, it's going to be underneath our satellites. Which means it may not miss. They're just, have you ever noticed the government will lie to you if it serves their purposes? One of the things that really got me is there is actually laws protecting politicians when they look in the camera on the Senate floor and lie through their teeth. They cannot be held responsible for what they say. So will the government lie to you? for reasons of national security or covering their own blessed assurance or many other reasons. But out of the very asteroid belt that was formed by the destruction of Rahab is probably going to come the several meteorites that we see hitting the earth in the book of Revelation. One is called Wormwood that poisons the oceans. Another one strikes land and contaminates all the groundwater. And so it's interesting that a part of Lucifer's old habitat, if you will, is farms in judgment. But when you understand that there was some authority given, but when God created man, he created him out of earth and gave him authority, we're going to find out why the devil needs human beings. He can do very little on his own even though he brags about being the God of this world and the king of this world, he can do absolutely nothing unless he deceives a man or deceives a woman and uses them and puts them into power. Okay. Now, in this, in this conflict of, of earth or through the matrix, if you will, in John 10, 1, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter in by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs in another way, he is a thief and a robber. What's he referring to? Fallen angels. You see, the door is the womb of woman. That's one of the reasons that Jesus had to come born of a woman. He was all man, all God. He could move in that authority. He came as the second Adam. He passed the test. He got the authority back. But where did the watchers come? They came in another way. They just landed, if you will, or they materialized into, into first heaven. All of humanity is made of earth, and humanity has authority to move in the earth. And we're connected to this planet. You know, we, we talk about, you know, having colonies on Mars and colonies way out in space. Well, there's a problem with uh, leaving terra firma, okay? It's called the Schumann Resonance. 
7.86, that the earth is still resonating with the voice of God when God said, let there be, and he recreated it. And we're locked into that. And our ability to function and retain our right mind is based upon the overall resonance of the earth. And even the New Age movement knows this. They, uh, they were uh, here a few years back when I was writing my first book. They were saying there, there is a coming uh, paradigm shift because the resonance of the earth is changing. And uh, I tell you what, if it changes too much, we'd go loopy as bedbugs, which may kind of explain maybe what's going on in D.C. right now. Their resonance has changed, at least the earth they're carrying around. But when, and so I reached out to Dr. Begich and saying, you know, has the resonance of the earth changed? He said, not only has it not changed, there's no sign of it changing. Because it's the combined resonance of all the earth and everything in it. Okay? But whenever we have astronauts go out of the atmosphere, whether they're in the space station or on the moon, they have to have a Schumann resonator both in their, in their when they're, like let's say they're, they're doing a moonwalk or they're doing a spacewalk. They have to have that in their suit and they have to have it in their vehicles and in the International Space Station. Otherwise, you'll begin to mentally break down. So we are connected to planet Earth because Almighty God made us of this Earth. You know, what goes on on Mars? Who knows? I mean, one of these days, Lord comes back, I'm going to, say, I'm going to ask you, you know, what, what's the deal about Mars? I know that Ali Esther Crowley in his work on, on his book on the law that he channeled, he said there was a gleaming prize basically had been left by, by angels on Mars, which may explain why NASA wants to get up there so bad. Maybe watcher technology that they didn't have on Earth, we don't know. Could have been that day when he wrote that thing, he smoked too much, whatever. There's also a possibility but guys, we need to understand that the kingdom of darkness strove to steal and usurp the authority of man. Okay. Genesis 6 is another interesting wave. We talk about the Nephilim. Well, what are they? Half fallen angel, half man. They're not redeemable because they, they've gone over the line, but they have enough earth in them to move in authority, and they become the heroes, the men of renown of old. We get the legends of Hercules and Apollo and all these different ones from them. In fact, demons, where the church got its, its spiritual warfare in the early church, was from the book of Enoch. And that those are, there are some traditions that try to teach that demons are just simply lesser angels that got mad at God. No, they're not. They're fallen Nephilim spirits. And you see the understanding of that even being expressed to Jesus when he kind of said, are you here to torment us before the time? They know that because they were half angel, half human, they couldn't go up, couldn't go down, and they're here waiting for the day of judgment, which is what the book of Enoch teaches. Now, Jesus didn't stop and say, I'm sorry, but you know, when we get to the 21st century, that's not going to be part of Scripture. And he did not correct their theology because Jesus agreed with it. He just told them to shut up and come out. Okay. Now, Jesus was born of a woman so that he could move in this authority. And we need to, we need to understand that Everything the enemy does, he had to affect the clay. He had to affect our will to resist God. Isn't that what the old nature is? We, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were infused with the iniquity force, which that iniquity, when you see when Lucifer fell, that iniquity, avan, means a violent reaction to God's rulership, his kingdom, his laws, his ways. So I will not be touched by you. I will not be controlled by you. I will, I will be a God unto myself. That's the old man that we have had ever since Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay, I haven't lost anybody yet. 
authority, but authority has been usurped. Man's in big problems because now the clay got all messed up, okay? And we, we see this in Genesis 2 and 7 when God originally made Adam. And, you know, some of these verses, you say, why do you always go back to Genesis for? It's the beginning. You have to go back to the beginning of the story to understand. And what I have found out about the Word of God, the Word of God is very interactive. It will give you the answers if you ask the right questions. And sometimes you can ask a different question and go back to the same scriptures, and there is a, there is a, a, faucet, or a facet there that begins helping you understand that answer. Okay? And it says, Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God says, I'm going to create man in my image. So when God created Adam, he represented the perfect image of God. Okay? In fact, this is the first place we get the concept of the potter and the clay. God made clay, formed it into a man, breathed life into it. And why was the image of God so completely manifested in Adam at that moment when he took his first breath, by the way, which was the Holy Spirit? Why, what, what happened? The clay gave no resistance to the hand. No resistance at all. Because of that, just like a coin that has the image of a president or something stamped to it, God's stamp, his image, was pushed into that clay. But the problem is Adam fell, and the image was marred. So embedded in the clay is the old nature. Did you know you're going to struggle with that to some point until the day that you die? And one of these days we're going to get some new clay. Woo! But doesn't the word say old things have passed away, old things become new? As far as God's account, but we still got to crucify the flesh. And we have too many people that are trying to put the label of righteousness on tenacious clay that refuses, that resists God's hand. Okay? And see, the things that I'm sharing, the rabbis knew. So we're, go we're going to get into Romans chapter 9, but you can't take Romans chapter 9 by itself. You have to hear it with the ears of those to whom it was written. That's one of the things I'm doing with the book of Revelation. The more that I study into it, the more I've got to go and read the apocryphal literature of the Second Temple period because everything in the book of Revelation, John used the language that the people would understand because it was common. It was common. But 2,000 years later, we go, what? Okay, well, it's, it's the same with a lot of this, that, that a rabbi would hear what Paul was sharing in his rabbinical argument about predestination and all these different things from everything that he already knew from the Word. Not taking a snippet out, taking it out of context, or out of the knowledge base that was built within the people of that generation, Okay. And so Jeremiah has a vision from God in Jeremiah chapter 18. And this is really the cornerstone of understanding foreknowledge and predestination. How many know God wants to work his image back into his clay? Okay. And so picking up in verse 1. And the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Rise and go down to the potter's house, and I will announce my words to you. <coughs> so I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. So the potter got the clay. He's already busy at work, working on the clay. 
But verse 4, but, this, this is pivotal in this understanding. He said, okay, I'm going to make this out of this clay. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter. How I many know oh, God doesn't spoil anything? The clay was fighting back. I'm going to make you a vessel of honor. I don't want to be a vessel of honor. I don't want to be a cowboy or whatever. You know, I don't want to be that. Because he was sharing this was a vision of, of God doing stuff with Israel. This was a part of this vision of what God is saying, listen, I got you on the wheel. I got you, man. He's, for me as a believer, the most reassuring place in all of existence is when I'm in the hands of God. In fact, I get real nervous when I can't feel his hands, you know. And yet that clay refused to yield in the potter's hand. Now, any time that you have uh, talked with anybody that has done pottery, that or any, any type of thing, I know, I know Michelangelo, when he was talking about the great statues that he was making out of granite and marble and stuff, he said, I just had to see what was there and cleared the rubble away. Because sometimes you want to make a cut this way, but the rock refuses. Sometimes you want to do something with the clay. There's an impurity or it's an incorrect mixture of the clay, and it refuses to yield to the vision of the artist that is making it. This, this is something common. Now, for the here, everybody had to do some type of pottery or something. Otherwise, you couldn't even have anything in your homes. That the knowledge of doing this was very common within that culture and they knew the tenaciousness of the clay and how it could refuse if the potter was wanting to make something very elegant and detailed out of it but the clay refused okay I'm just gonna have to make you a spittoon because you refuse to do anything else that's that's what he's painting here okay said so, but the Vessel that he was making out of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter, so he made it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Okay, I have plan A. You're refusing plan A, so I've got to go to plan B. And he's talking about God. You know, sometimes when you start connecting the dots in the Word, on the first day of Pentecost... Not the one in the book of Acts, but the one in Exodus. God takes him to Mount Sinai, and the mountain's on fire, and God begins to speak. This is the covenant that I want to have with you. And one of the things that the sages of Israel teach is that when God spoke that, that the entire world heard. And there were Egyptians there and from other people that were in Egypt that came with them. Okay, we're going to serve your God. And they came with them that heard. All of them responded. But the rest of the planet did not. And so now we see on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, the reasons that we have that particular manifestation of tongues, it was a reenactment of the first one, but the fire didn't fall on the mountain, it fell on the believers. And they responded. And they heard it in their original native language. Now they may have all been Jewish, but you know there's, there are a lot of people that if you, that if you would, let's say, uh, sit down and visit with Jews coming out of Russia, their native tongue is Russian. And they secondarily will speak Hebrew, some more proficient than others. And it would be the same for all these, wherever they were coming in the world, they were coming into Jerusalem for the feast. And it was a reactment, and we had thousands saved that day because Peter announced the covenant. And it was, and what he didn't realize even in doing that, it was going to become one day available to all people. That's why there's a direct correlation between that day and the home of Cornelius. It had to be exactly the same as the door was open. You see, Peter did have the keys. Acts chapter 2, he opened it to the Jew. In Cornelius' house, he went down and had the key and opened it up to the Gentiles. 
And so we, we, we see this imagery that they knew that you can't understand Acts chapter 2 without understanding Exodus. It's the same way with understanding the clay and God wanting to reestablish his image on the inside of us. And the, foundation, the foundational stone for understanding where we are now after the fall is Jeremiah 18. That part of our process, if you will, as a believer, is I've got to crucify enough of the flesh that my clay won't resist the hand of God for reinstilling the image of Christ within. And some of us have very, very ornery clay. Okay, now... When you de- start dealing with the free will of the clay and the vessel, there are two very interesting ones that we see. The Pharaoh of Egypt. You know, it talks about, and God hardened his heart. That's actually a poor translation. He strengthened his heart because the Pharaoh set his will to not let the people go. Regardless of the cost, and God said, okay, that's the, that's the avenue that you're choosing to go down. Okay? I'm going to strengthen you to carry out your will because I gave you free will. And he strengthened his heart. The other one was Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn, but he didn't consider being the And firstborn comes not only with privileges, but responsibilities. And now some of the things that you can read in the Talmud and other things, some of it's good and some of it you just have this big question mark. One of the Talmudic lessons about Esau when he came back and, and uh, Jacob you know, sold him the, the porridge. Well, supposedly, they, the rabbis teach it was, uh, it was their dad's 100th celebration of him being 100. And it was the responsibility of the firstborn son to make the meal for him. And he was out hunting and doing other things, and so he didn't consider that worth anything. And so when, when he came back, Jacob said, I want, you know, I went and did everything that you were supposed to do, so I want, I want the blessing, I want that firstborn is me, not you, because I'm doing everything and you're not. That's how dismissive Esau was. And see, the things that Esau said in his life was so dismissive that it, it embedded that in, in the clay that he produced in his lineage. God saw what the descendants of Esau would do. And, and some try to connect it to, to Moab and many other things. And how that they were a, a thorn and an adversary to the people of God all the time. God saw what he started and that he would not change. And it would transfer over into his descendants. It was so strong. And that's what caused God to hate Esau. Where God knew with Jacob, the surplanter, that he was kind of blessed. You know, when, when he came out from Laban, he was, I mean, he had a caravan. He had wife and kids and sheep and goats and everything else. It was a long caravan. And he gets on the other side and he's wrestling a Christophany, the angel of the Lord, all night long. And, and finally, the, the angel says, what do you want? I want another blessing. It's like, dude, you got a caravan, you know. But he had not, in his mindset, there was the old surplanter and conniver going on. But that night, the clay was wrestling with God. The Bible says that that clay, that that angel reached down and touched the hollow of his thigh which I think represents complete submission because that day after that he limped. In other words, his walk was different. How many of us that are our greatest problems in life is not the devil? It's us. It's our clay. God, I'll, I'll give you up to this point, and after that I got some plans. And with my plans comes an attitude. Anybody ever met a believer with an attitude? This far, no more. Don't want to get crazy with my Christianity, you know. Don't want to go overboard. 
Well, the Bible calls these notes all in. He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back isn't worthy. That's what Jesus said. And the, some of our great struggling that we think, we're struggling with the devil, the devil's just after us. God needs to open our eyes because it's the hands of Jesus saying, I've got to get you to where you come to grips with your old conniving, ornery self. Because I want to make something better of you than where you're headed. Nobody ever says, ever, yeah, well, brother, it was like when you'd say to the church, I don't know, brother. But they never look in the mirror about themselves. They always know somebody else. It's like when somebody doesn't show up for church that Sunday, they said, you know, boy, boy they really needed to hear that message. So God in his sovereignty didn't realize they weren't going to be there, and you sat there, but the message wasn't for you. That's the clay fighting back. Now let's go to Romans 9, because this is, the entire book of Romans is a rabbinical argument. Sometimes he's rebuking the Romans, the other time he's rebuking the rabbis that are also in Rome. And I don't really have time to, to get into all of it, but the, the, the pivotal thing is, is toward the end, because the Jews are mad that Gentiles are coming into the faith and not having to physically become Jewish. Okay? And you look at, when you look at what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes during the intertestamental period, you can understand why. Their people were slaughtered if they were circumcised. That entire families, entire lines were wiped out because they wanted to obey God. Now, and it was done by the hands of a Gentile. Now you have Gentiles coming in, and they don't have to do the snip and clip. Okay. Point of contention. I would use sore point, but that's very obvious. Point of contention, okay. But he begins to quote Isaiah in 25. And he says, he says also in, in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people. And her who was not my beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called B'nai Elohim, the sons of the living God. You see, the new birth. In the Old Testament, B'nai Elohim was only used for the kings of Israel that were adopted by God and for angels. We get a title like the angels had sons of God. But in, in as he gets into this argument, you know, that, you know, hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the rabbis understood that Pharaoh had, had set his heart to resist God. And then he brings up Esau. We don't understand how much the Apostle Paul lined up every rabbi and just slapped them in the face just as hard as he could. The Gentiles are getting in because you have a heart like Esau that you did not respect being the firstborn of God in the earth. And you started setting up your own rules and your own regulations and you, you, you had set aside Moses for your own traditions. And God saw this coming. And he prophesied from Hosea, those who are not my people are going to become my sons. And they're going to act like sons. Whew. So many that don't understand the argument, that don't understand the things that were already lined out in the Word, looks at this and says, I'm just a mud part because God made me one. I remember the first time I watched Godfather. You know, when the mafia, mafia boss is, is going and talking to his priest and says, you know, what can I do? You know, God made me a murderer and made me a mobster. Well, see, the Catholic Church draws it from Augustine, then Calvin picked up on that and put it on steroids. I'm just clay in his hands. God just made me this way. That's why, that's why you got to repent. <laughs> 
There's got to be a reworking of the clay. Okay? I'm going to make sure I don't skip anything here in my notes. Because if we take Romans 9 to mean what it means and, and without the understanding of the old, then the Apostle Paul contradicted himself. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 20. How many know Paul doesn't contradict himself? You just got to understand the discussion. Who it was to, what it was about, and what they knew. Okay. Now in a large house, there are, not, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. People like to stop right there. I'm just a mud pot. I'm just a wooden pot with a big knot head. Just going to leave it there. No, because God made me this way. But they don't want to read verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, and he's talking about sin in the previous verses, cleanses himself of youthful sin and strife and all the things that mess the clay up, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. So the difference in being an earthenware or a woodenware or gold or silver is not based upon what God designed, but based upon the vessel and how it would respond to the sanctification process of the Holy Spirit. When you understand Jeremiah 18 is the key to understanding Romans 9 and then understanding what he's teaching young Timothy here. That we have a say. In fact, I forgot the one that I wanted to do out of Romans 8. Let me grab that. Because actually Romans 8 is done before Romans 9. Is that deep? <laughs> Romans 8 is before Romans 9. And everybody went, wow. Let's see if I can find real quick what I was looking for. And having a new Bible, I don't have it highlighted. Yes, it's about pre 29. Thank you. I need to turn the page. Let's actually jump up to 28. Is that okay? I'm going to put this in my notes so we can make the right slide. Through 30. Okay. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love and who are called according to his purposes. Doesn't mean that God orchestrated it, but if you're the clay in his hands, he can work it out. Is what this is talking about. But I want you to see the sequence for those whom he foreknew. How many know God foreknew everybody? The moment he said, Light be, the omnipresence of God fills, both, fills time space. All of space, everywhere. I don't care if you're dealing with a quantum level or whatever level, God is there. But he also he filled from the very first second to the very last second. Eternity is existence without time. Time is a created thing. He filled it all. He experienced it all. Then he limited the devil to move through time linearly like we did. You want to talk about handicapping somebody. He lived in eternity where there wasn't such thing as time. Then I create time. And then I'm going to make you put along with time just like everybody else, but you don't die. But you don't know what I'm going to do. You don't know how it's going to work out. But did you ever see the charts when they do on sci-fi? They talk about a divergent timelines because somebody made a decision and it ends up being like a, a, just a real mess. Well, that's from the human point of view. From God's point of view, it's just one straight line. 
because he has seen everything the devil could ever try to do. He has seen every plan, every, every way that he has done anything. In fact, for us, he saw every possible way to present the gospel to us and which one would work and when it would work. He saw that. And for the sinner that refused, God saw every possible way of getting the truth to him, and he knew no matter what he would do, he would reject it. But you see the heart of God. You know, one of the things that we, we always read in the book of Revelation, those whose names are not found in the book of life, they, they spend eternity in, in the lake of fire. And then we read in the book of Revelation about people having their name blotted out. I remember when... Uh, being raised as a Baptist, you know, come to the altar, have your name written. No, there's no, there's not a single place where you can find have your name written because in eternity past, before God said light be, every single name of every single person was written in the book. God is forced to blot it out when they die without Christ. That's the heart of a father. And then... You read at the great white throne judgment. I know I'm, I'm going off my notes, but there's, there's these quandaries that you, you, you have to put together. Okay, you're there. Your name is not found in the book of life. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Your future is in the lake of fire. End of discussion. The Bible doesn't stop there. It says, and other books were open. What other books? God's plan for your life. God shows you what could have been if you had yielded. In fact, I think it's at that moment that hell really begins for you. That you saw what could have been if you would have yielded to the hands of the potter. I think Christians have something similar happen to them. We find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 3, where we get judged. That our lives are presented before Jesus, and the fire of God descends on it. Everything that was of the old stubborn clay is wood, hay, and stubble. What happens to wood, hay, and stubble when you hit it with fire? You better have some hot dogs handy, because you're going to have a quick wiener roast. I mean, it's going to be nothing but ash. The gold, silver, and precious stones are where in our lives that the clay yielded to the potter. And Paul even confesses, he said, there's going to be some that have absolutely nothing left. I mean, even their Willy Wonka golden ticket got burned up. They have nothing to present before the king. That's one of the things you learn about the feast. You never appear before the Lord empty-handed. Well, the only thing that we can take with us is what we've done. It's that gold. Do you ever wonder where the crowns came from that we pass out, that we throw at the feet of Jesus? Is there an angel with a big stack of crowns? One for you, one for you. When I say go, everybody cast them. Gold, silver, and precious gems are what you make crowns out of. We get to wear it long enough to realize it was Him doing it through us. And our natural response is we cast it at His feet and say it was because of your hands on my life. It was because of grace. It was because of what you had done. That's foreknowledge. All of it is foreknowledge. And the, the grace of God even though he knew from the very beginning that Joe Schmo would never get saved, he had a plan for him just as if he would. Because it's the hope of a father's heart. And so those that he foreknew, he predestined. That's putting his seal of approval on. Mike, I see that an old Baptist summer camp when you were 12 years old, you were sitting out there thinking that you were saved. And when, I, when my spirit speaks to you and come to the realization that being going to a Baptist church wasn't enough to get you into heaven and that you needed Jesus, 
that you were going to run to the altar and get saved. I am predestinating that by my foreknowledge. And hell cannot stop you from reaching that altar. Every demon in hell would have tried to get you to drop dead before you got to that altar. But because I predestined it because of my foreknowledge, hell couldn't stop it. It's all right there. Oh. Those, but let's not just stop. He also predestined, but, be pre- 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 de- but to be predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. Restoring the image. Restoring the image. That's predestination. Restoring the image. So that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. My big brother has a big family. I may be adopted, but I've spent so much time with that family. You can't tell I'm not naturally one of his. I'm learning to walk and talk and act like my big brother. And the longer I'm around him, the more I act like him. I get the same attitudes. Nobody's ever seen that in the family, have you? I mean, some families that are close, they can have adopted kids that were adopted young. And the way they act, you cannot tell the difference between those that were naturally born and those that were adopted in because they take on the mannerism, the customs, the beliefs of the family. And they understand the responsibility, if you've been raised right, on the responsibility of caring the family name. Then they can look at their siblings and say, you know, mom and dad were stuck with you, but they chose me. (laughs) That kind of goes on sometimes in families too. (sighs) And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those that he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. What's he talking about? He who has begun a good work is able to complete it in you. Because he foreknew that you would yield, he predestined it. And then he set everything in your, in your path to, get, to lead you toward glorification. Glorification? I get a glorified, upgraded body. I can move in all 12 dimensions. One of the things I'm excited about, it will be my DNA perfected. So my K gets replaced with a six pack in my glorified body and it is not subject to French fries, fried chicken, or any other thing that I can enjoy dinner, especially when I'm sitting with my heavenly father. I don't have to worry about adding pounds, counting calories. I mean, that's just enough to have the hallelujah fit right there, okay? Never be subject to death. Never be subject to sickness and disease. Because I'm headed toward a glorified body. And you know what? The devil can't stop that either. He may think he controls the earth. But the earth can't stop the resurrection. We are, I mean, that battle's already been won. Death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. I'm sure the devil put everything, all the pressure he could on that tomb. And they just scattered in 50 different directions when that tomb began to be opened and Jesus walked out. The devil can't hold your resurrection back either. Because you are predestined. (laughs) Here's our responsibility. We find this in Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 and 13. 
This is why the, the work of the priesthood is so important because that outer court work takes the junk out of the clay that would resist the hands of God. He's talking to those down in Philippi, and he says, So then, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but not much more in my absence, work out your salvation with cheers and backflips and little parties, and you now can do what you want to do. Is that what it says? Fear and trembling. Why fear and trembling? Because we know what's still in the clay. Got to work it out. Did you ever notice? I should have kind of looked when I started, what time I started. Don't worry, the camera will hold 32 hours. I promise I will not use it up today. Years ago, I used to think it was my calling of God to fill up the entire 90 minute cassette tape. You were back in the old cassette tape days. Where was I going? I joked and I lost it. Oh, well, God will bring it back to my memory. Philippians, fear and trembling. The body of Christ has lost the fear of God. Our Willy Wonka golden ticket, hyper grace, gives powerment to our flesh in our minds to where we can resist the working of God because now there's no such thing as sin. There's something called sin, all right. What is sin will always be sin, and there is not one single verse in the Bible where Jesus came to redeem sin. He came to set you free of the power of sin. But see, if I understand the process, the one who can get in the way of God the most is me. If I do not have reverence toward his hands. And I know in my life, there was, there was a scene in a movie The Rock was in called The Rundown. He went in and this guy, I guess, owed some money. He says, you have two ways of doing it. You can give me the ring. Or number two, I'm going to make you give me the ring. You know, the to honor a bet, or whatever it was it was, but I looked at it and I said, my gosh, I heard the Holy Spirit in that because the Holy Spirit is saying, Mike, I need to work this into you, and it's predestined, it's, it's part of being conformed into the image of Jesus that you signed up for when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You signed up for this, you volunteered for this, and you're going to eventually look like Jesus. Now you, you have two ways of doing it. You have the easy way, submitting, or plan B. Wasted years, wasted tears. And Mike, it's all up to you. Little crucifixion now, or pain and tears and hurt, and then a little crucifixion. But it's going to feel, you know, it's going to be this big. When you get there, it's going to feel this big. Because not only did you refuse to yield, you established your identity on what I was trying to work out of you. So we're now, instead of trimming your nails, it's like I'm pulling off an arm. That's why Paul said, fear and trembling. Because the more that I can feel his hand, the more I know I can trust it. You see, there's something that happens to the clay when you're in the hands of God. Because he goes on to say, for God will cause you to will and to do. You see, God's after your will. Our will has got to become His will. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the old man. Yes, I am going to. The Lord just brought it back to me. 
There's an interesting thing about Judas. He betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. I don't believe that Judas for a minute thought that they were going to crucify him. He was trying to force the hand of Messiah to take over now. Every time they tried, Jesus, I mean, there, how many times did we read in the Gospels, and they rose up to stone him, and he just walked, excuse me, make a hole, people. And he just walked through them. Every time they tried to get him into a, the, into a theological debate or, a, or, or a, uh, a situation that there's no way that you could answer right, Jesus not only answered right, but he shut everybody up. And he literally thought, I'm tired of him just meandering around if he's going to be Messiah, because he was a zealot, remember? He's going to drive out Rome. I'm tired of Roman rule. I'm going to force the hand of God. He goes and he hangs himself. Oh, by the way, he didn't hang himself on a tree like an old western. He hung himself on his sword. He fell on his sword. That's why his guts come rushing out. That will happen when you run a sword through yourself. And so the rabbis are here and they got their 30 pieces of silver back as he went and threw it at them and said, I don't want this. Now, the very guys that took it out of the treasury to betray Jesus, now because it was blood money, couldn't put it back in. Hmm. But they go and they buy a field. What's it called? The potter's field. The potter's field is used for two purposes. To discard broken vessels and to get clay. The betrayal of Jesus opened the door for Jesus to go down and say, it's not just enough to get back the earth. I'm going to get back all the vessels the enemy had broken. <laughs> He puts us up there on that spinning wheel, starts adding oil and the water of the Word and the oil of the Holy Spirit. And the crack may have been there, the break may have been there. When he gets through, there's no crack at all. There's an elegance because of the Master's touch if the vessel will learn to yield to the hand of the potter. That's why all things can work for good. It wasn't the will of God for you to be wounded and cracked and thrown out as nothing. But the price that we see Jesus paid, he paid a horrible price. Betrayed by one of his twelve. Gave him over to the enemies for the specific purpose that he was going to be crucified. No matter what he said, no matter what he did, they had established that in their heart, not knowing it was God's plan all along. All that happened so that Jesus could not only inherit the clay, but all the broken vessels to renew and to restore. You see, for me... That's the reason why I can yield to his hands. Because those hands have piercings through them. He paid a price for the right to go and gather me and to remold me. Him I can trust. These other demonic things that wanted me to pay the price for their folly, for their treachery, for their pleasure, or whatever it was. They didn't earn right to anything, and they just discarded me. That, 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 when we even come to the concept of redemption, there are several words the Apostle Paul uses, agorizo and ex agorizo in the Greek. And it literally talks about the slave market. You see, the potter's field is after the slavers are done. And you're discarded as yesterday's trash. 
But Jesus not only delivered us from the effects of the slave market, when the Apostle Paul used ex agorizo, it means he brings us to a state in which we were never a slave. To be conformed into the image of his dear son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Now you understand predestination from a biblical view. And it ought to cause us to say, Jesus, whatever you want to make of me, you can make of me. Because I know your hands I can trust. And I know anything that you work out of my life was for my sake. And for the sake of my loved ones and my family. Because one of the things I found out about cracked pots, cracked pots will crack pots. Every wounded person will wound a person. But someone who has been restored becomes an advocate for reconciliation and restoration. Because our desire is to see every believer conformed into the image of Jesus. May the body of Christ regain this knowledge and may we have enough respect for the name Christian to wear it properly. The Pope did not give it. It was given as ridicule to those that lived in Antioch in the book of Acts time. Because they were trying to be so much like Jesus, the pagans were ridiculing them and call, called them Christians. Little Christs running around. Oh, may it be so. May everybody in our lives, when they look at us, they see Jesus. May the devil, when he looks at you, sees Jesus and says, uh-oh. Especially if he sees Jesus wearing his armor. Now you understand Ephesians 6. The image reset without carnality hanging out of the edges contained in the armor of God. That's our destiny. Lord, let it be so. Give us a grace in this generation to yield to the hands of the potter. To throw off the follies of bad theology and easy churchianity. And let us pick up our crosses daily, Jesus, and follow you, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition defies the Shinar directive. A plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com.
That's store.biblical-life.com.